Yes, I was very happy to see Professor Fellman on the Data Over Dogma podcast talking to the two Dans about uh, the Priestly source in particular and the neo-documentary hypothesis just in general. I don't know if you know this, but it's long been my secret hope to evangelize Dan McClellan into the neo-documentary hypothesis. So any exposure that we can get him to proponents of the neo-documentary hypothesis just warms my heart. But this is a great question right here. How does the neo-documentary hypothesis differ from other kinds of the documentary hypothesis? Uh, and the too long didn't read version is that the neo-documentary hypothesis is a newer, more simple, more stripped down, more modest version of the documentary hypothesis. It really represents sort of a back to basics approach for the documentary hypothesis. It shares 95% of its sort of positions or beliefs in common with other kinds of the documentary hypothesis. It's largely a difference in method. And I should take just a moment to say that it's not as though the documentary hypothesis itself has existed undisturbed and unchanged for a long period of time. And then all of a sudden the neo-documentary hypothesis comes along and sort of radically disrupts the status quo. It's not like that at all. The, neo the documentary hypothesis in general has been around for 250 years at least. Uh, and it, is, it has evolved substantially over time in the hands of different scholars, all, many of which who have had um, small variations to the hypothesis in general. So it's much more like a, you know, a, an evolving line of continuity over time, in, in which case the neo-documentary hypothesis just happens to be sort of a, a point around which several biblical scholars are sort of gathering to do their work. Um, but it, it has so much in common uh, with older forms of the documentary hypothesis. But as I said before, it's a simpler and more modest version of the documentary hypothesis. Let me give you three examples to that effect. Number one, redactors. Uh, a redactor is somebody who compiles and edits a text together. Uh, the documentary hypothesis, especially in the middle of the 20th century, became kind of bloated with respect to its willingness to posit the existence of as many redactors as was necessary or as was convenient in order to help sort of get the theory out the door. Biblical scholars took to positing redactors for any feature of the text that wouldn't fit sort of into their overarching framework. So it became a, a convenient way to explain away things that were not convenient for the theory. You see something in the text you didn't expect, oh, that must have been a redactor or something like that. And so you had biblical scholars who were saying, you know, there's two, three, four, five, six or more redactors who eventually put together this material that makes up the Pentateuch. Uh, contrast that with the neo-documentary hypothesis, which puts forward only a single redactor at the very end of the process, who then edits together four completed and independent texts. So in that respect, it's much simpler. Uh, and, in, and in that instance, it's also much more grounded in the evidence, because we have to be able to account for um, the editorial process somehow, and we account for that in the simplest way by positing only a single editor. Number two, methods. Older forms of the documentary hypothesis would distinguish between the sources in a lot of different ways, sometimes in ways that weren't particularly compelling. Uh, if a particular word appeared in the passage, they'd say, oh, that word goes with this source always, so this passage must go to that source. Or this theme appears in this passage, and this theme is always found in this one source, so it must be that source. Or this name for God only appears in this source, uh, and we find it in this passage, so this passage must be from this source. The problem is that these arguments get very circular very quickly. If you say this passage must go to this source because it contains this word or this theme, well, how do you know that that source contains that word and that theme and none of the other ones do? This is a judgment that you can only make after having distinguished the sources from each other. So we need independent criteria for distinguishing the sources from one another before we then go on to talk about what characterizes these different sources. The neo-documentary hypothesis fixes this by s distinguishing between the sources almost exclusively on the basis of narrative continuity. So you read the text until you encounter some unnecessary contradictory repetition, uh, and then you use these contradictory narrative claims to parse out different threads of a story, and it's these threads uh, that then become the sources over time. For example, you read Genesis chapter 1 and into the beginning of Genesis chapter 2 until all of a sudden you encounter what? A second creation story that acts as though the first never happened. Uh, 
right? Or you're reading along in the flood story and the beginning of Genesis chapter six, and you see, well, here's a perfectly good reason for why God would start the flood, at least within the context of the story. And then you get to a second perfectly good reason why God would start the flood, or you get to, you know, two separate sets of the animals that Noah ought to bring onto the ark, or two separate lengths for the flood, or two separate promises from God afterwards that he won't do this again, right? You read until you encounter these narrative discontinuities, and you explain the discontinuities by parsing out these different sources. This is a much more precise way of distinguishing amongst the sources, and every other tool at our disposal then just comes in service of these. So after you've done that, then you can talk about the, the different themes that the sources prefer and the different language that the sources prefer and the different ideological biases that these sources have. Number three, dating. Uh, so proponents of older forms of the documentary hypothesis were very quick to try to argue for dates uh, for these four different sources that they had identified. In fact, using these sources to help understand the evolution or de-evolution of ancient Israelite religion was one of the main components of Julius Wellhausen's sort of popularization of the documentary hypothesis at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so dating was all the rage. It was sort of baked into what the documentary hypothesis was good for for a long period of time. Today, I think in general, scholars are much more skeptical about our ability to give precise dating for a lot of biblical texts. And so the neo-documentary hypothesis as a hypothesis does not try to give absolute dating uh, for the four sources. Uh, sometimes scholars will talk about relative dating, so the, the dating of the sources relative to each other. This one comes later than that one or something like that. Um, but usually you, you, you can only get a an absolute date out of them if you like force them to. Um, but that's quite distinct from the hypothesis itself. The hypothesis itself does not claim absolute dating for the sources, even if biblical scholars have, you know, sneaking suspicions about, about when a text was composed. I'm a big fan of the neo-documentary hypothesis. I think it's a great time to be a proponent of the neo-documentary hypothesis. I think it's in a strong position because it deals with so many of the criticisms uh, that were specific to older versions of the documentary hypothesis. Uh, and so I think you, you find a lot of so when people who are adopting other positions, they're sort of behind, right? They have all their criticisms of your position are sort of old and outdated. And now you have this new hotness that is sort of immune to all these older criticisms. So I think it feels like it's in a, in a very strong position right now. Also, some of the major proponents of the neo-documentary hypothesis are well positioned in leading universities and they're cranking out books and papers and directly engaging with other proponents of like the supplementary hypothesis, uh, for example, and doing a heck of a job of it, I think. Um, so what a time to be alive, right? What a time to have your, you know, your nerdy <laughs> theory of the Pentateuch's composition, like having its day in the sun.